Well, Nolan, you're all the way across the stage. I can barely see. Thing. We made it. It's a good thing. <laughs> and Steve and I, just, just to let you all know, Steve and I just finished our second civility session of mm -hmm. the conference. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, we're a little tired of all the harmony. So, <laughs> so if you We've all were getting a big racket, we'd appreciate it and make, <laughs> make good theater, yeah. right? So, Steve, kick it off. All right, so I think we have to start uh, with the big news last week and this week. Uh, the first significant uh, auto insurance reform legislation uh, in this state in my lifetime. In fact, since 1973, uh, everyone said we couldn't do this. Everyone said that the disagreements uh, across the aisle were too significant. Um, I, I'd love for each of you to talk about how we got to the deal that we saw the governor sign uh, on the porch today. Uh, Speaker, I'll start with you. Sure. Well, this is uh, certainly a big win for the state of Michigan. and. Who would think that in an era of divided government, when you have a first-time governor, a first-time majority leader, a first-time speaker, and uh, really newly formed relationships in the House and Senate, that this would be the time that we tackle it? Um, and I think it truly was an understanding at the very beginning of this term, the very first conversation I had with the governor, uh, ultimately centered around this. You and I can either share in the blame for nothing getting done, or we can share in the credit for things getting done. And this was an excellent example uh, of what happens when you truly can put politics aside. We're going to have our differences, we know that, um, and just focus on the policy. And I think it's a great testament of what can happen in divided government when you truly have an attempt to find consensus. And I think it was a great way to start the, the term off. Uh, we have many other important issues we have to tackle. And in an era of divided government, you need to negotiate, but all negotiations require a relationship and you don't have that without trust. That's what was built during this process. So it was a big win for seven million drivers in our state, but it was also a big win for everyone up here. Um, and, uh, and I think we now have more faith from our caucuses and the people of our state. And there's a lot of optimism up here on the island right now, and as there should be. And uh, so I was very excited about it, happy to partner with the governor uh, to get that done. Yeah, I mean, I think during the negotiations, too, what was really important is that we kept going back to that very first day of the 100th legislature when we said we would work together. Um, and, and it did take all of us at the table. And to all credit to the governor, too, with all her legislative experience coming into this position, that was a really uh, critical role as well to, to bring everyone together and really work through some of the details. Stephen, were you born in 1973? <laughs> just, <laughs> just barely. I okay. would have been two. Right. Right. <laughs> I believe the difference this time was that in every previous attempt to reform auto insurance in Michigan, it was done through a filter heavily weighted toward one of the four special interests, and it allowed the other interests to pick away at it. And when we started this one, we said we we're going to do this one way and one way only, right down the middle, and we're going to be representing drivers in Michigan, not special interests. At the end, if we got equal amount of complaints from all the special interests, we did a pretty good job, and I think we succeeded in that. There were four goals in my mind that we were trying to achieve. I think we hit the home run on three of the four, and the fourth one, we got a little more work to do. Mm. Uh, Jim, uh, lots of people, I think, reflexively believe that that Detroit and Detroiters pay the highest insurance rates uh, in the state and some of the highest in the nation. In fact, there was a study that came out last month that showed it's, it's drivers in Flint uh, who actually are paying uh, the highest rates. So, so talk about how important this, uh, this compromise was to your vote. You can't catch a break on anything. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, no, it was, it, it, was, uh, it was extremely important not just for the residents of Flint and the drivers of Flint, but everywhere. But I think we were seeing a, a de facto, um, we were criminalizing poor people mm -hmm. because so many people in my community and across the state, particularly in urban communities, just made the choice not to buy insurance and hoped they didn't get caught. And when they did, obviously we've seen, you know, people, they, 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 they get something on their record, they end up being penalized for that. And I think we came up with a, a pretty good compromise here that should encourage people to, to follow the law and get insurance, should be significantly lower for them. Uh, and we, keep, we kept in place the, the coverage model to make sure that people still, uh, if something terrible happens, they still are, are covered. And I think 
you know, as, as Mike said, we're going to have to go back and look at this. This, this is any good piece of legislation is a, is a, is changed over and over and over again. That's that's okay, but it was a really important first step and a start. How big a factor was Dan Gilbert's threat to start a petition drive, or his actual beginning of that citizens' initiative drive? What role did that play in pushing this thing forward? Jump in, anybody. <laughs> I, I think when, when you tackle something that's eluded the state for 30 years, victory has a thousand fathers. And there's multiple dynamics you can point to of why we were able to accomplish this reform. I think a real political dynamic was there were stakeholders and special interests that have built their entire business model around the current system of auto no-fault. And, you know, for the past 20 years, their only goal was to truly block the legislature from reforming it in a way that would cause them to have to adjust their business model. And with Dan Gilbert's threat out there of potentially putting it on the ballot and it being more aggressive than ours, it did make the special interest realize, hey, you know what, maybe we have to negotiate on this. Maybe but, the legislature's on But didn't it also take away some of the governor's le le leverage in this, these negotiations? She had wanted to tie this to a budget deal and to a fuel tax hike. Did that take those things off the table? I think you're underestimating my governor. And uh, Dan had been sending the signal that he was willing to do that for many, many months. Mm -hmm. The fact that he chose to do it in that particular week, uh, I can tell you that we were already engaged in very fruitful negotiations with the gov my governor at that time. And so you can read into that any way you want to. <laughs> it was, uh, the timing was interesting, but I don't think it moved the needle. So you got that done. Everybody's happy. Uh, now, Wait, is that all the time we're going to spend on celebrating this? And we're going to go into something else? <laughs> yeah, we got we got a hard question. Yeah, well, we're, yeah. before we go to the next before we go to the next question, you what have, have you done for me lately? <laughs> you twice have referred to the governor as my governor, uh, Senator. That that might shock some people, given that uh, you come from the opposite party. Well, it wouldn't shock anybody that's been listening to me since January, <laughs> because that's how I've been re referring to her since as then. It? You yeah. know, I, this is a representative democracy, and I believe at my core that voters are always right. Doesn't mean I always agree with voters, yeah. but they're always right. And so what I think we have an obligation to do is when voters speak, we sit back and learn, try to learn what they're telling us, not complain about what they did. And Governor Whitmer is my governor, and she's going to be my governor until she's not elected. And I'm committed to, to uh, supporting her in every way I can, uh, you know, given the differences that we have. But yeah. uh, there's, you know, there's two circles of overlap here, and I still say there's 75% of overlap that we're common on, and the other, the other pieces, you know, maybe not. Yeah. So, Mike, you're all that stands between us and some really good bourbon down at the tent tonight, so we are going to move this along <laughs> and go to road funding. Uh, I'm all for I mean, that. <laughs> you, you all came together on this. Can we expect a similar uh, coming together on funding for roads? Well, we certainly need to. <laughs> that infrastructure and education are such top critical issues. And again, the voters told us over and over again they want those two areas tackled too. So, you know, we listened on, on the insurance and we came together for that. And we absolutely have to do it again when it comes to the roads and education. But Representative Greg, if you posted a bill, if there was a bill posted for a 45 cent tax hike, fuel tax hike, would your caucus support it? You know what? If they want to put up half the votes, I'll put up half the votes. We'll get it done. You know, that's we've got to work together and get it done. Jim, I can put up half. I mean, I mean, or obviously we'll wait to see what uh, our colleagues put out as a plan, and we'll find some sort of compromise. But I think we have a a serious responsibility to make sure uh, that we address this infrastructure uh, at roads and bridges and things of that nature, and also make sure that we continue to get our budgets done. Uh, in, a, in a, uh, a way that we have predictability. Uh, Any Republican we... votes for a fuel tax hike of that size? Nope. Yeah. yeah, there <laughs> unfortunately will not be half the caucus <laughs> supporting a 45 cent yeah. gas tax. So where does the money come from? Yeah. So I'm a little frustrated that, that the only focus is on money. You know, money is a key part of it, but I believe we need to change our culture in Michigan and make sure that transportation, infrastructure, and all things associated with that are part of our long-term structure and culture. And so I'm committed to doing exactly what we did with regards to insurance reform, and that is a very deliberate, focused process. And in the Senate, 
we're going to do it in two pieces. And one, and one piece is going to be uh, finance and funding related, and the other piece is going to be related to operations, quality, and value. And my goal, and I hope I can convince my colleagues to be our goal, is to leave a legacy in Michigan so that future legislatures, all they have to do is essentially continue to incorporate what we set the standard for. The best gift we can give to this state on this topic is the ability to see forward five to even 10 years, make it a stretch, so that those associated with making sure we have good roads have a long-term planning horizon that they can count on and not have to worry about the next budget cycle. Lee, you're not even on board with the $2 billion, $2.5 billion figure for roads. So first, let me answer. You asked a question first. Um, you know, are we going to see the same you know, collaboration on roads as we saw as no fault? I mean, we ended in a good spot on car insurance. Mm -hmm. We ended today on the porch. But it was a rocky road to get there, right? We all know that, and we acknowledge that, and that's okay. You know, government isn't always intended to be pretty, but the outcome, hopefully, is that you want to see good policy. And, you know, the pathway to seeing our roads fixed might not be completely uh, without bumps either. But at the same time, we have to assess the situation. That's what we did on No Fault. We assessed there was a problem. We realized it was holding our state back. And then we came together with a solution. I would say on roads, we're still assessing the problem. There's differences, Nolan, since the day I you know, took office. In 2014, every single specialist out there said our roads need about $1.2 billion of additional funding. By 2015, it was $2 billion. Well, we got to 1.2. Now we're being told it's 2.5. It's difficult to hit a target that's always changing. But I've said from day one, I don't want to have a conversation about new revenue until every penny that's paid at the pump is going towards roads. That is the heart of the problem in our state. We're an outlier because of it. We pay in the top five in taxes at the pump in the country. But our roads are garbage. Why? Because not all of it's going to roads. It's a no-brainer. That needs to be addressed first. So, so you say that the number keeps going up, but it's kind of like your house, right? If you need a new roof today and the estimate is $5,000, uh, and you put $1,000 into it, uh, how much more do you need in a year or two? It might be six or seven or $8,000. And, and so I, I guess I, I would love for you to, t to talk about why you think, and uh, Senator Shirker, you said the same kind of thing, money's not the only issue. Uh, how, how can we get to an agreement that, uh, that we've got to finally take care of this from a money perspective uh, in a comprehensive way, do you do you do you not believe that uh, that that kind of solution is achievable? Oh, I absolutely believe it's achievable. I think if there's anyone up here who didn't believe it's achievable to come to a compromise, they should probably step down in their leadership position. You know, all of us need to be committed to coming up with a solution. Um, but there's going to be differences of opinion in how we get there. You know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder as far as what a good plan is. But I will tell you this, as long as there's a pothole in the road, people are still going to say there's not enough funding for roads. And I think it's, it's important that we acknowledge that. What is incumbent on us as leaders is to ensure that we're working collaboratively with each other and saying, let's fund our roads through a responsible budget that's not breaking you know, the budgets of our Michigan families. Because I will tell you this, on the 45 cent gas tax increase, I applaud the governor for putting out a plan. But the people of our state cannot afford a 45 cent gas tax increase. Because of that, they don't support it. And, and, and that will not be adopted. So we're starting from scratch, but with a renewed sense of we're going to find a solution. It's going to take time. Well, and I think something that's so important to get started in the conversation is having agreed upon set of facts, right? One of the first questions I ask is how much does it cost to maintain roads? And for every $1 you spend maintaining a good road, it costs $14 to get a, a bad road up to good condition. That is basic math. And when we're talking about taxpayer dollars, that's where it's so important to start from that because we're actually costing the taxpayers more in the long run the longer we keep our roads at that lower level of quality. So I think you start with the math. And we've had study after study that has told us we are short. And even though we passed, uh, the legislature passed some additional revenue in 2015, it only slowed the decline. It did not improve the trajectory of having more roads in good, in good condition. So, Senator, Senator, and I'm going to say something right. too, because yeah. in 2015, that was the, that everyone understood that was going to happen. So the perception that people were saying, oh, we fixed the roads, or we're patting ourselves on the back, it was never going to happen. And people knew it. And I think this idea that this 
this target is moving is a, is a bit misleading. In 2010, the experts told us it was 1.2. Every year we delayed, the numbers were going up and up and up. So, I mean, in 2014, it was not 1.2. And we had to have the dollars then, not phased in over a number of years. It was a, it was a bad decision then, and we're gonna have to go back and fix it. I think that's the reason why the number is so big. I don't like the number being so big. I'm disappointed that people in the past kicked the, road, the can down the road, but they did. So now we have to solve the problem. It took, took 30 years to solve the insurance a debate. I think it's taken 30 years or so, 21 years, to, to fix the wrong roads plan they passed in 97. I think it's gonna take some work to do it, but it's, gonna be, it's not gonna be a, a smooth path. I completely agree with you, and I think Mike's point is another, is another good one. We do have to look at the, the resource side, but then we have to make sure that we have efficiencies and we do things the right way. And we have to look at this in a short and a long term, because the gas tax is a, is a dying mode to, to fund our roads, because cars are becoming more efficient, we're right. gonna see automation, but we have to fix the problem now. So I think it's, it's something that we have to get really get serious about, and I've, I believe that we will, and I know the governor will as well, but I think this is something, the longer we delay, the, the bigger the problem gets. Do we have the capacity to spend that much money on roads? Do we have that many road crews uh, to spend an extra $2 billion on top of the $1.2 billion that we're already, we've already added? If we give the industry long enough time to adjust for it, absolutely. This is a balance between the appetite of taxpayers and the capacity of the industry to deploy assets. And as long as we try to keep that in balance, we'll be fine. It may not be fast enough to, to suit some people, but that is an important balance to keep in mind. So Senator Shirky, the, the Senate has said it is working on a plan to answer the 45 uh, cent per gallon gas tax proposal. Uh, we haven't heard a lot about that. Do you want to give us a little preview of uh, what that's going to look like and when we will see it? I think the last time I was on your radio show, Stephen, was in January, and you asked me when we would come up with a plan for insurance reform, and my answer to you was, when it's ready. <laughs> Is that your answer now, That's too? <laughs> so, so but, but can you commit to the idea that uh, whatever plan the Senate puts on the table will address the problem in the same way, in the sort of same comprehensive way that the governor's proposal does. In other words, uh, her, her proposal adds up to the full uh, amount that, that most of the experts agree we need uh, to fix the roads and keep them in good shape. Is the Senate committed to doing the same thing with its plan? So I'm gonna talk again, I'm gonna beat this dead horse until it gets across to uh, you, Stephen, but <laughs> to me this is a culture change, okay. all right? I'm gonna tell the story. In 1839, William Henry Stewart was just newly elected governor of New York State, 1839. In his inaugural address on January 1st of 1839, his top three priorities were more money for public education, more money for infrastructure, at that time it was canals and rails, but it's the same point, and more in a concern about uh, skilled labor. So my point is, is that this is anybody who thinks, anybody who thinks we're gonna come up with a road package and tie a ribbon around it and put it on the shelf and never have to revisit it again is not very smart. We're gonna do this and create a culture that just continues well beyond the service of those of us that are sitting privileged to serve here right now. And yes, the 2.5 billion that the governor has laid out there as a goal, I think it's a, it's a legitimate goal. We may have a difference in how quickly, because again, it's the balance between the appetite of taxpayers and the ability of the industry to deploy. And we gotta keep that in balance. Yeah, I just wanted to add just one more thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about dedicating the, the fuel tax um, to go directly to the roads and take off the sales tax, remember that sales tax, a good portion of it goes to the school aid fund. And so as part of that solution, we have to make sure that we don't fund one thing to the detriment of another. And we have to look at the entire picture. If we do make all the revenue dedicated at the, at the gas pump, we have to make sure that we're making up that money for the school aid fund too, because education is a top priority. But Christine, well. that does confuse voters because they see the pump prices here. They see the pump prices in Ohio, same. Sure. Uh, we take that sales tax and use it for other things. Uh, they're now going to see much higher pump prices uh, here than they do in their neighboring states. How do you sell that to them uh, when our roads are, are, are so much worse? Yeah, I'm not saying it's bad not to have it dedicated to it. I'm just saying if you do take off the sales tax revenue, mm -hmm. you have to make it up somewhere for the school aid fund. Where does that come from, Jim? If you move the sales tax 
to roads? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been operating off of uh, the proposal the governor put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Lee's point is it's a legitimate one. I mean, there's no question there's, there is a, a sense of distrust uh, in government in general. Uh, and I think that if we dedicate, uh, if, we, if people know that the money's going to go, and I hate to use this term, I sound like Al Gore, but if you basically put the money in a lockbox, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you at least with that, you could at least then restore the trust, right? So that people know that if they're paying for something related to, to, a, to a gas tax or some, some variation of that, it's going, whatever we do, it's all going to roads. Because I think that would be, that would help get people the, they don't, they don't believe that we're going to do, if we're going to raise the money, they don't believe it's going to go to the problem. If we can solve that aspect of it, it makes, it makes the amount of money we need to raise that much easier. So I think we have to build some trust by making sure that whatever we do, it's transparent and people know exactly where it's going to go. Uh, and then we can have a, a larger conversation about where it comes from. So, so a related issue, of course, is the budget, uh, which, which the roads are some portion uh, of the, the sort of larger question about uh, how we're going to spend money for the next fiscal year. Uh, we have gotten accustomed in this state to, to getting that business done almost before we get here to Mackinac, if not by the end of the week. Uh, that's not done now. Uh, I wonder if each of you could talk about dates by which you would be, uh, start to maybe be uncomfortable uh, with the idea that we didn't have a budget. Uh, can you commit to staying throughout the summer, for instance, uh, to make sure that we get a budget and don't get back into the situation where we're staring at you know, the end of the fiscal year and, and, and don't have a plan? Speaker. Yeah, I think the first step just needs to be that we have a responsible budget. I do know over the last eight years, you know, one of Governor Snyder's priorities was always to get it done by a certain artificially set date. I think it's irresponsible to box ourselves in um, because when you get close to that deadline, you start making quick decisions. So I think goal number one needs to be a responsible budget. The fact is this, if, if I had a carte blanche agreement by the governor that she'd sign a budget, we could have it to her probably next week. But we know that we're going to have to negotiate. We're going to have to work. And, you know, we're in an era of divided government. And uh, her budget proposal was a one month behind, which is typical for a first year governor. And you know, of 110 members, 45 are new in the House. I've been serving five months and have never voted on a budget, uh, close to $60 billion. I will tell you this, I think it would be irresponsible for all of us if we held uh, the budget hostage only because of roads. We have a lot of things that need to be funded, our schools, our local units of government. They need to know, they need to have certainty about what's coming down the pike. Now, we're going to have the roads debate. I will tell you this, if we link the roads and the budget and say we're not going to separate them, sure, it could be a long summer. But we, we have to be willing to have both conversations, but not necessarily have to tie them together. So then, so then if we get to uh, you know, August, September, uh, without a budget, and we're looking at you know at the end of the fiscal year. How, how will you explain that to your constituents? You know, I think if the people of the state of Michigan wanted a budget in June, I think they'd have a constitutional amendment that said we want the budget in June. But right now, the Constitution says October first, and I think our main priority needs to be to have a responsible budget. Listen, I'm married with five children. I'd love to have a summer. Okay, I'd love to enjoy myself. But the fact is, I was elected to this position. And we're going to do as long as it takes to have a good budget. Representative Gray? Well, we need to keep working on it. Even though our fiscal year starts October 1st, the schools start July 1st. And I think it's also responsible to make sure that they have certainty on how they budget. And I really do see, uh, looking at the roads issue, uh, you know, it's the governor's budget, right? It wasn't just roads. It impacted education as well. And that is integral to the budget itself. So I would like to see those conversations happening at the same time and also be aware of, of the impact we have on schools and municipalities when we don't get a budget done uh, in, by midsummer. Do any of you see this going to the deadline? Not me. <laughs> I don't think it needs to, no. So what will, what will sort of shake loose that allows us to, to get past the current impasse. So what, what, what's, the, uh, uh, what's the sticking point that we get unstuck, I guess, uh, to get to a deal? Just well, why, why are we assuming that there's a stuckiness? Well, uh, I guess, uh, well, I mean. Because we don't have a budget. Because there's no budget and because, uh, you know, the roads question looms pretty large in the background. I mean, I think uh, 
the impression that I think most people have is that that's one of the big sticking points. Uh, maybe there's some others too. Uh, but is it your impression that we're not stuck? No, I don't think we're stuck at all. We just made great progress on something that's important to everybody in this panel, plus everybody in the state of Michigan. Yeah. And now we're going to, in earnest, uh, continue on the budget. I believe it will be shameful if we don't have, at least from a legislative standpoint, a, a, a proposed budget to the governor in, in, in near-term times like we have in the past eight years. It'd be shameful for us to lose that discipline. And then the negotiation would continue. It doesn't require the entire legislature to be in Lansing to do that. And, uh, and only, the only problem where we would run into stuckiness <laughs> is if we decided that we're going to tie the two together, which I simply say we won't. Hmm. Yeah. So, so far in the House, we've passed out subcommittee budgets out of appropriations. And some of the approaches going in is to do a blanket 25% cut to IT projects. So that's clearly not the answer what we need to do. These are systems that... Um, administer unemployment systems, foster kids, all of that. We have a lot of work to do on those. But the major budgets, transportation and education, they haven't come out of the subcommittees yet. So in, in a way, we are stalled right now, and we need to get back to work and really hash out those details. Yeah, we're limiting ourselves with short-sightedness, and that's a product of term limits. We're looking back to eight years and saying we got it done in June, therefore we're stuck. The fact is this. It's no surprise to anyone in this room. Car insurance has monopolized the conversation over the last three months, and now we're going to begin having open conversations on the budget. I'm optimistic. I am sitting here with what we just accomplished, saying we're going to get this done. We're going to work together. We have an open mind on it, but I, I don't view it as we're stuck. We are taking our time, uh, and part of that simply has been we've invested a lot of time and effort into car insurance, but I think seven million drivers will be happy next year that we did. <laughs> Should you work through the summer? Does anyone feel the need to work through the summer until this is done? I think to Mike's point, I don't want to speak for him, but I think I understand what he's saying. I tend to agree with him. Is you know, there's this common, I think, misconception sometimes that 148 people need to be sitting in the chamber, mm -hmm. just sitting there. I mean, there's obviously appropriation members, the leadership. I think uh, there's nothing wrong with you know work groups meeting. I think those things should happen. I think those things will happen. I think we can get to a solution uh, to both the issues of getting a, a responsible on time and investing budget, and also making sure that we have resources for roads. So I think. In my opinion, I mean, I don't set the schedule, um, but um, <clears throat> I think that there'll be people working this summer. I just don't know if people need to be sitting in a chamber uh, while there's nothing to vote on. You know, I, I, but I, I, like I say, I, I don't set the schedule, but I'm hoping that that's at least. We'll try to find you some time off, Jim. Thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any appetite in the legislature to take up Prop A? I know our local communities have been, you know, sort of pushing back against Prop A because of the slow recovery of the property tax revenue that was lost during the Great Recession. Will you be taking that up? Will you be revisiting, reopening Proposal A? It is my intention that we evaluate the original intent of Proposal A and assess whether, how well it achieved the intended goals and what the unintended consequences may have been. My definition of taking up means to do that assessment. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. But it's not going to happen until after a budget, after roads, because it's a shiny object that will get a lot of attention. And, but it's, that, that is the one missing element that has been a frustration for me since, since the beginning of the legislature, is we don't take enough time to do retrospective oversight and reviewing the decisions for spending we've made, reviewing the decisions on policy that we've made, and seeing if they're actually performing as, as expected or not. And uh, it's a culture change, another culture change that I'm hoping that we, we can, the four of us can, can change. It's one of the reasons why when Mike set up the oversight committee, and there were some folks you know, so, sort of saying, oh, they're only doing this because it's a Democratic governor. Uh, and you didn't hear me clamor, you actually heard me be in support of it because Mike and, I'm ha Mike and I have had a number of conversations over the last well, number of years, but particularly over the last year, about how it's really extremely important. And, and I, I agree with Mike on this assessment that we we pass things and we act like we're just done, like as if looking back at something is some, somehow an admission of guilt. It's a, it's our responsibility to look at everything that we do. And I think Proposal A is one that is you know it's 20 some years old now. Uh, it was one of the first votes I took. I actually voted no, but um, it's neither here nor there. But it's it was I, I think it's important to look back at all those kinds of things and say. Is it performing at the level it should be? Are there flaws in it? Can we make adjustments? Do we need to overhaul it completely? 
And <clears throat> I, 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 this is kind of what I see some of the functions of the oversight committee, obviously some of the committee process in, in general. Uh, so we can do like, you know, there's big things we have to do within a time frame. And then there's other things that you can take more time and be more thoughtful with. And I think, you know, we should do both. I think we can do both. But we also have 148 members that are immensely talented in these chambers, right? We can be putting work groups together. We have so much experience with local gov government to mm -hmm. take a look at revenue sharing. We have more educators than ever elected to look at the school funding model. There's, there's nothing to say that this has to be a linear approach. We have immense talents in these two chambers on both sides of the aisle, and we can start looking at those issues mm -hmm. at the same time we're doing the other big things. So I agree. I, I feel like actually half the work we do in the legislature is fixing bills that we voted on the previous <laughs> right? I mean, you're, you're constantly doing trailer bills. You're doing fixes to what you addressed last term. Uh, but I, you know, I'm going to call a spade a spade. I think this is a product of term limits. And let me speak for myself. There you go. Let me speak for myself. I mean, I am in my fifth year. And I'm still understanding the process, still learning the complexities of all these issues. And yet you're the speaker of the house. And, and by the time you know, I leave this third and final term, I'll feel like, hey, I've got my feet on the ground, I'm ready to go, and I'm gone. So you only have so many large issues, truly, that you can tackle every single term. Every single person who's sitting up there that's a freshman legislator right now, it feels like they've been drinking water through a fire hose these last five months. And they just voted on the biggest piece of legislation that has been voted on in our chamber, arguably, in the last 20 years. And that is a problem. It's been the problem. Do any of you all think term limits have worked for Michigan? So what can we do about it? What can you all do about it? I intend, I'll share this in this group and amongst my friends here, but I intend to address that issue in three years from now. And we're gonna challenge the notion and challenge the appetite of the state of Michigan and the legislature to really evaluate whether it's something that we think is necessary or not. With a ballot proposal? Yes. Three, three years from now, so 2022. Yeah. yeah. And what will... 2021. Yeah. What's, uh, right. will, will you try to scrap term limits, extend term limits? So there's no, there's no middle ground here. Uh, I, this, is, this is just Mike's opinion, okay? This, this is Mike's opinion. <laughs> but if you either have term limits, term limits or you don't. Hmm. We have natural term limits. They're called two-year and four-year election cycles. You know, and uh, so I'm, I'm not one of the ilk to say, let's change it from the current model to, you know, pick a number. Anybody can serve 20 years, any combination. I think that's just another uh, loosely term, term limit option. Listen, we've eliminated all the incentives to make it a career. There's no post-retirement, post-service uh, retirement. There's no post-service uh, health care. Uh, you know, we get, we get paid, but... Uh, all of us could make a whole lot more money not doing what we're doing. So all the incentives to making it a career have been gone. That was the reason in which term limits were so attractive, you know, because there were a lot of incentives for, for people to make it a career. And so I think it's time that we test that, test that message, and we'll see if the citizens of Michigan buy it or not. You three sign on? Well, I have to look at the proposal, of course, but I, I don't. I, I surprised I, him with this. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, we haven't <laughs> talked about this. So, you know, I, like, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I mean, I'm taking my inspiration from voters, not politicians, right? So here is this citizen-led group that tackled this huge issue of gerrymandering. And they went across the state and they educated the public, and then they they made this happen, where we passed this independent commission. And I know after the election, they went around and held town, town halls and. You know, part of the conversation is what's next, and tackling term limits was one of one of the topics that came up a lot. And I think if it's driven from the citizens, I think that's so powerful. And I would really like to work with that group as well. So I'll add just one thing: it's alleged gerrymandering. However, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, that's, not, that's not what the court <laughs> says. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Touché. you know, I will tell you this: obviously, anything is going to have to be voted on by the people. Right. And we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that there's a political ramification to it. And many times things at the ballot are of a populace in nature. So we do have to take that into consideration, anything that we're going to put before the people. And they need to know that those that are currently serving don't benefit from it. I think that's going to be a key component of it. So you would have to keep term limits in place for the current I think none well, of us have had this. On the proposal. We haven't had this internal conversation, but I'm telling you, you know, you want to go out there and test to the people, hey, you think politicians should be able to serve longer? That's going down. That's going down harder than, you know, the 45 cent gas tax, okay? <laughs> people would not support that. 
<laughs> but if it's done in a way where you do other important reforms in it, and I don't know what those reforms are right now, mm -hmm. but you put other important reforms in it where they feel like, hey, there's, they're actually making real progress. Maybe it's an ethics pack. I don't know what it is, but there's got to be something in there where they say, I can support that. So you all mentioned, uh, one of you mentioned the uh, reapportionment and Christine. This, this, uh, <laughs> the, the ruling from the Sixth Circuit Court panel that you all have to uh, do a partial redistricting plan for the 2020 election affecting 14 districts, 14 Senate districts. How disruptive is that going to be if the Supreme Court doesn't make it stay permanent? Extremely disruptive can and you do counterproductive it? and frictional loss and all the other negative connotations you can associate it with. <laughs> but if that's what the courts rule, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what we'll have to do. You can, you can put to bed for at least for a time period any other big reforms past the ones we've talked about mm -hmm. because that's going to take all, it's, it's a shiny object, will take everybody's attention. You expect to have to do it? I do not expect to have to do it, no. Jim? I do not either. Uh, we should talk a little about education. Uh, the governor's current budget proposal uh, includes quite a few increases uh, for education, uh, more than we have seen in, uh, in recent years. Uh, up here on uh, Mackinac, we had uh, Jeb Bush here today to talk again uh, about the things that they've done in Florida to, to, to move up the, the, the rankings of states uh, when it comes to education. That's happened as we have moved down, uh, of course. Uh, talk about the, the, the proposals that are on the table in the, in the current budget and whether you support the idea that, uh, that we need more money. We need more money in our schools. I don't think there's many things we do that are as important as you know, training the next generation and ensuring that they're equipped to enter the next phase of their life. And I stood with all the quadrant leaders earlier at a launch in Michigan uh, announcement and with the study that they're doing and just said we're eagerly awaiting the report. Obviously education and roads are nonpartisan, but they are often politicized, let's be honest, and many times it's, you know, at the heart of many different debates that we have. Um, so I think we need to have a renewed focus on education. I think one of the ideas, since you asked for specifics, mm -hmm. that the governor has proposed with, you know, being a former teacher, mm -hmm. I see a direct benefit in is having literacy coaches. I think you know, having the fundamental ability to read is at the core of all education. And having additional help in the classroom, listening to the teachers, having literacy coaches. I don't know what the right amount is for funding. I'm not, I don't know. But having additional help in the classroom to teach these kids how to read, it's, it's a foundation they can build on, um, you know, later years in elementary and in high school. So much of what I think we're seeing with some of our low proficiency scores in high school is due to, you know, the, the terrible success rating we have at third grade reading. Yeah. So let's focus on the reading, and I think that will be an excellent foundation we can build off of. Well, there's a lot to be done, and I really look forward to the Launch Michigan report as well for, for their ideas. And, and what I really like about it is, is going out and looking to states like Massachusetts, like Florida, to see what they're doing and really taking the best practices and how they ap apply to Michigan. Um, but we know classroom size is, is an issue for some grade level, so we need to look at that. We need to look at teachers and how to better support them. Uh, I just attended a retirement party for Dr. Joyce Fouts, and she started the Galileo Project 22 years ago. And what that is, is empowering teachers and teaching them to be, it's teachers as leaders, and really putting the focus on professional development and empowering teachers to really manage their own classrooms. So that's like the ultimate local control, um, is to give them the resources they need and then use their professional uh, you know, training and skills to really be the best in that classroom. And I, I would really like to see a lot of work on that as well. Jeb Bush, when he spoke to us today, urged us to be bold uh, in considering education reform. We haven't been bold in Michigan. One of the bold things he did, the first thing he did in Florida before he put in all these other reforms that we're trying to emulate was consolidate authority for schools under the governor. He, he eliminated the independent elected school board. Is there any appetite for doing that in Michigan? You brought that up this morning when we had a radio yeah. interview, and it's the first time it actually has crossed my mind, and I've been thinking about it since then. I think there's a real, real 
opportunity there for us to evaluate that. I don't have in my mind a final conclusion, but you've raised some questions that I think are worth, worth uh, exploring. You know, when it's tied to, to the governor and who holds that office, then I think you have more of a tendency to, to have those pendulum swings, though, on your education policy. With the elected state school board that we have, not everyone turns over at the same time. And they, I believe they have, do they have eight-year terms on the school board, too? I believe so. So you have more consistency in that, too. And, and that's, that's what I worry about a lot with our education policy, that we, we are doing these major pendulum swings. And maybe that's bold, but I also think that when you're talking about kids at the center of the, of the policy, you have to be very intentional and deliberate as well. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I've, uh, I fought it for as long as I could, but... Um, I spend a lot of time with Mike, and I now I'm starting to think like an engineer. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, not sure very, I'm not sure if I'm very good one. I wouldn't uh, only fix your car, but uh, uh, so I, I think the question's an important one. But I think we've had some conversations without dis disclosing things that are happening at the quadrant level. I think I'd like to look at like, okay, let's assess what the problem is and work our way back from it, right? And I think. We've, and I, I, I kind of, this is a weird analogy I'm going to make, but it kind of reminds me of like what we've been doing with criminal justice reform. These were well-intentioned ideas in many cases. Some of them, you know, I don't want to, I'm not even going to put motive behind them, where we, now we prescribe almost every second of the day for a teacher. They, it is dehumanizing. It is terrible for, for our educational system. And I'm not saying we should just wipe them all out. I mean, I, I think that might be, that's a pretty bold stroke as well, but like, I think we need to look and say, okay, do we really need to be this prescriptive? Is it, the, the teachers aren't robots, right? They're not at two o'clock on Tuesday. Every everyone in the, in, the, in the Michigan should not be teaching, you know, the, the U.S. Constitution. There should be some flexibility. There should be some understanding that these are human beings and that they're interacting with children. I mean, Lee and I taught, and there's a number of other educators in the room, and also that are serving with us. I think there's a way to address this in a real impactful way that that frees up the ability for educators to be. To, to be the best in their craft and to have, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to actually educate kids and make sure that we're succeeding at the same time. And I, there's different ways to do that, and I think that's where the debate will happen, and we'll have some uh, interesting ideas, and I think a lot of people in, the, in both chambers will have input on that. But if we, could, if we do that, if we address the, assess the problem first and work our way back, something like what you said should be on the table as well. But I think we need to make sure we assess what the real root of the problem is and then work our way backwards. So I'll be brief because I know we're running out of time. I want to parlay off of that. I, I will tell you this, what we need are legislative leaders who are listening to the professionals in the field. Mm -hmm. um, I am firmly committed that the answers to education are not in Lansing. The answers to education are not in Washington, but I think they're in the classrooms right now and we have to enable teachers to teach and give them the ability to do what they love. And I think our system has been an injustice to all educators across our state. Uh, we've only got two minutes left, but uh, you guys didn't really answer the question there. Uh, <laughs> money. Like There's that? money in the budget to put uh, you know, more resources behind some of the things in, uh, in education that people say we need to do. Is that the answer? Talk about money versus uh, other kinds of reform. I think it can be a part of the answer, but it is not the sole answer. There need to be reforms, and we need to be committed to finding what those real reforms are. Well, I did answer your question, right? If you reduce you class did. sizes, That's that right. costs that costs, that costs money, right? right? But um, you know, we also we're starting to move toward this model, and it, some of it was in the governor's budget as well. Is you know, let's have the the standard level. Uh, I think we're using the one one and a half x formula or two x formula, and then have these special areas of investment. So. Um, let's put the resources where they're the most needed. So if you have um, higher transportation needs, extra dollars for that, or high special education needs, extra dollars for that. We have to rethink how we are doing this funding. And there are so many needs. The, the finance, uh, School Finance Research Collaborative laid it all out. Again, we've had studies that say we are underfunding, and if we really want to achieve and get up to a top 10 state and really take care of our kids, which is our economic future as a state as well, we have to get more investment in there, and that comes down to the budget. Yeah. Senator? Senator? Money Turkey. can be part of the equation. I don't believe money is the crux of our issue in education. Hmm. If we do decide to spend some more strategic, targeted money in education, I sure hope we have very finely refined and defined metrics to measure whether it actually worked or not. 
and not assume it's just a perpetual progress without, you know, without uh, checking on it. But money isn't the crux of our education issue in Michigan. I think we need to, um, uh, to make sure we put resources in, in, in many ways with the governor suggest in the budget. I think that's a good place. Uh, I also think, and I'm going to do this again, Mike. Earlier I quoted uh, Mike at the Launch Michigan thing, and I think this is a really important way to, I mean, if you think about education policy, uh, Mike earlier, Mike says quite often is, you, you, always, you always find what you're looking for. And think about education policy for the last 10, 20 years, and how many times have we used the word failure? And almost every discussion we talk about failure. We're failing to do this. We're failing to do that. It's, a, it's no reason to wonder why we have a failing system. We're not, we don't have a success system. We need to have a success system and a success goal, and we will reach that goal. And one of the ways, um, a component of it, both in the short and long term, is money. But it's also making sure that we do, we're using the money effect, effectively and efficiently, and if it doesn't work, we stop doing it. Because we'll keep spending on things even if it doesn't work sometimes, and that's just a fool's errand. Well, thank you all. We appreciate it. We're out of time. Thanks for the discussion.